Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't we get started? I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco. I'm fortunate enough to direct the Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. On behalf of my program and the Global Health Initiative and all my colleagues here at the Wilson Center, it's a tremendous opportunity and privilege for us to be facilitating this afternoon's discussion, hosting a session that's really a, a, a funder's roundtable, taking stock and looking forward on the future of family planning strategies, looking at population, family planning, reproductive health questions. And we're very fortunate to have a number of, well, literally the uh, world's leading uh, funders in this area and a perspective that all of us are, for obvious reasons, very interested in. And I think um, perhaps first and foremost, because as opposed to many of us who are working on pieces and some in the field and some in policy and some in research, um, they're really expected to cross these worlds, um, often cross them by region, cross them by topic at different scale, and, and really have a, a perspective that, uh, if, if not unique, uh, is, is rare in terms of its breadth, but also by, by necessity its depth. Uh, so I think it's a terrific opportunity for us to, to have this forum, have this discussion, and have some uh, really distinguished folks in this field lead us through it. Uh, you picked up with the participants list their bio, so I'll keep it, I'll keep it very short. Uh, but we're very pleased to have Masimbi Cunyaro, who is the Director of Population Reproductive Health Program at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. So Masimbi, welcome. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Scott Radloff, um, a, familiar, a familiar face in, in this hall, which is terrific. Scott is the director of the Office of Population Reproductive Health here in the building at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And then in from Seattle, although I don't think it's fair to say that Oyang sits in any one place for very long, but Jose Ramon, uh, who is the senior program officer, global health policy and advocacy from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, someone who is also, of course, very well known to this community, having spent many years just up the road at, at Hopkins. So uh, Oyang, it's terrific to welcome all three of you here. Uh, we have to unfortunately convey Regrets from Julia Bunting. She sends her regrets from DFID. We'd hope to have her at least on uh, live video, but um, important things like uh, maternity and uh, the immediacy of having, having uh, young children has uh, unfortunately kept her from us. We knew that going into it, so we were optimistic, but um, she, she, sends her, she sends her regrets and her support for the endeavor that we're doing. Uh, and then also we will open with a, a short video, a show in a moment, um, from uh, Bert Kenders, who's the Minister of Development Cooperation from the Netherlands. We're very fortunate. I know that Mr. Marshall, who's the first Secretary of um, Political Affairs from the Embassy, is here with us. Uh, it's terrific that um, the Minister was very kind to tape uh, remarks specifically for this forum that we'll, we'll share with you in a moment. Um, and I think we'll, we'll turn to that and then bring our other colleagues, other speakers up. They'll make some short introductory remarks, then we'll have a bit of a roundtable and then open it up to the floor. We are broadcasting today's event live. So for those of you who are watching online, the uh, minister's video is embedded in the event page on the website. You can find it there. And then for future reference folks, you'll be able to find it on YouTube and a variety of places that we'll have linked from the Wilson Center. Uh, so you can send that and share it, share it with others. One final word just about where we're sitting, it means introduction, and there are a lot of familiar faces, so I beg your indulgence for just saying, uh, we're at the Woodrow Wilson Center, the formal memorial to President Wilson, uh, our only president to have a PhD, so a living memorial where worlds of scholarship and policy can come together and facilitating dialogue on various regions and topics. Our environmental change and security programs, the fifth, we're in our 15th year, trying to facilitate this discussion between population health, development, conservation and oftentimes in a broader foreign policy and security policy context. And I think that's one of the questions that we can have for our panelists today, how these population, reproductive health, family planning issues are connecting, or in some cases not connecting, with uh, these, some of these other important discourses. This event, like many that we, the Environmental Change Security Program, have, is supported very generously as it has been uh, for now going on uh, 13, 14 years. We have Duff Gillespie, Margaret Noyes, and Scott Rattle. We have the, the whole set of the continuity of, of support for this in terms of from AID's Office of Pop and Reproductive Health. So it's terrific to see all you folks here. So I'll ask my colleagues in the booth to roll this video. Then we'll bring our panelists up and continue the discussion. Thank you very much. 
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to take part in this roundtable. And well done to the Woodrow Wilson Center for organizing discussions on challenging subjects. Regrettably, family planning and reproductive health continue to pose challenges in the world of today. And I'm very sorry not to be able to take part in this roundtable in person. But I'm grateful for this opportunity to make my voice heard through this video message. First of all, I will talk about our experiences in this field, then refer to activities involving the Netherlands, and finally, I will discuss shortly some of the challenges we are facing. Taking your questions as a guideline, I'd like to focus on three issues. First, Cairo, the MDGs and young people. Second, opportunities. And three, challenges. First, Cairo, the MDGs and young people. I think everybody around the table will agree that family planning is one of the biggest success stories of development cooperation. I also consider the paradigm shift in this field from top-down family planning to programs of reproductive health and rights for couples and individuals adopted in Cairo in 1994 to be a success story. It took us another six years of hard work before we saw the Cairo agenda duly reflected in the MDGs. MDG target 5B, Universal Access to Reproductive Health by 2015, was not added until 2007. In those years, we battled it out with delegations representing the United States. Nowadays, however, we want to join forces with the United States administration in order to work in complementary ways for sexual and reproductive health and rights for everyone in order to achieve target 5P and MDG 5. We consider MDG 5 to be the mother of all MDGs. If the two MDG 5 targets are not achieved, then the other MDGs will not be attained either. It is smart economics to invest in MDG 5. Universal access means that everyone has right of access. Protecting, promoting and fulfilling this universal right also means giving all women adolescents and young people access to sexual and reproductive health information, services and commodities. What are their needs? We have data on the unmet need for family planning for married women. But what about the sexual and reproductive needs of unmarried women? And the needs of adolescents and young people? If we do not know what they need, how can we invest efficiently and effectively? My plea is that we should acknowledge the needs and rights of adolescents and young people, married and unmarried, in the field of sexual and reproductive health. They all have the right to information and services. I call on you to help convey that message and to do so with energy and determination. Then my second point, opportunities. The U United States administration is perceived by the SRHR community as the best opportunity for a long time. And I would like to highlight two other opportunities. There is a growing awareness, especially in Africa, that population issues have long been neglected in the development debate, in national planning, in investment in health and well-being, and even in fighting HIV AIDS. Demographic developments often mean fast-growing populations. And is that an opportunity or a threat? That depends on your perception. So population issues need to be approached sensitively and through well-informed and open debate. In my opinion, the starting point for the debate is the basic rights of all couples and individuals to decide freely and responsibly on the number, spacing and timing of their children and to have the information and means to do so, as was agreed in Cairo in 1994. The entry point for action is the unmet need for family planning. That is why I decided last year to increase our contribution to the Global Programme on Reproductive Health Commodity Security from 5 million to 30 million euros per year. Another opportunity is that of working with the private sector, with for-profit and non-profit organisations. I look forward to hearing more about the Gates Foundation's plans to expand their investment in reproductive health beyond maternal health. We would very much welcome increased investment in family planning and commodities. I'd like to give some examples of public-private partnerships supported by the Netherlands. The Female Condom Initiative was started by Dutch private sector organizations. Based on the existing demand by women, 
particularly in Africa, our current aim is to make the female condom more widely available, promote its use and try to lower the price of this commodity. We also support the CONCEPT Foundation, which promotes the production of generic abortion drugs and helps with their registration and introduction in countries which want to provide safer abortion services. Most recently, we have stepped up our support to Mary Stopes International, 6 million euros in 2009 and 2010, for expanding their social franchising activities, which means expansion of SRH services through qualified private practitioners. And then number three, the challenges. I see a great many challenges in this field, but I will confine myself to mentioning just two of them. Now that you have heard my plea for the SRHR of adolescents and young people, you will not be surprised that I see investment in youth as the biggest challenge for us all. The unprecedented number of young people, more than half of the world's population, compels us to make their future our priority. The second challenge is to provide a counterbalance to the growing opposition to sexual and reproductive health and rights. It's not only about abortion, but in a much wider sense also about the reproductive rights of women and girls. All these factors are closely linked to the deeply rooted imbalance in power relations between women and men and the increasing sexual violence against women. Although our embassies do indeed report on progress in the field of SRHR, they more often report on the growing opposition to it. In some countries, amendments to existing legislations have been proposed or have already been adopted, particularly in relation to abortion. These changes often result in unacceptable violations of the reproductive rights of women, severely impairing their chances of having the highest possible standards of health, which is a universal right. I find this unacceptable, and I will not be silent. During my country visits and meetings, I speak to government ministers and presidents, and I challenge you to do the same. We must join forces and use smart approaches in order to counterbalance the continuing and growing opposition to sexual and reproductive health and rights. We need long-term strategies, and we must act now. I wish you all a fruitful and inspiring roundtable discussion. Thank you very much. We'll start off from kind of the end of the table and work back towards me, and we'll start with Scott Radloff from USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. Great, thank you. So I've um, been at USAID for 26 years. I joined back in 1983. And uh, until this year, uh, we've had just two of those years, two of the 26 years, uh, were years in which we had a supportive Congress and a supportive White House for family planning reproductive health. You may um, recall the um, 1994 um, Cairo conference, I'm sorry, 1992 was the year that uh, the Clinton administration uh, came into uh, power, and um, 1994 was the year of the uh, Cairo conference. And the following year, 1995, was the high watermark in USAID funding for family planning reproductive health. Uh, one year later, our funding was reduced uh, dramatically by about one third. Um, we went from 541 million to 376 million dollars um, between 1995 and 96. And we also had our funds uh, metered at that time. So um, with the change in Congress, um, um, there was an attempt to bring uh, Mexico City back into place as law, and uh, because there, there's an annual battle over that with the Clinton administration, and um, the consequence was lower funding uh, for family planning reproductive health. Um, funding for this program um, actually increased under the, under the Bush administration, um, but family planning reproductive health wasn't a particular priority. Uh, and there wasn't a great deal of attention uh, placed on uh, family planning reproductive health. And as you heard from Bert um, uh, 
uh, Condors, there's, um, was actually resistance to um, MDG 5B on inter, um, universal access to reproductive health. Um, as I said, funding uh, went back up under the Bush administration. Mexico City policy came back into place. Uh, UNFPA was not funded. Um, so we now have a new environment uh, since uh, January. Uh, President Obama, on his third day in office, rescinded the Mexico City policy. In March, Secretary of State Clinton uh, announced the refunding of UNFPA. So we are once again able to work with key partners in advancing family planning reproductive health. We have uh, seen a positive engagement of the administration on reaffirming U.S. support for the MDGs, including MDG 5B, and improving access to reproductive health information and services, uh, and reaffirming support for the ICPD program of action. And I must say that um, Many um, bilateral donors, multilateral donors, and foundations uh, are now very interested in working closely with USAID in advancing these programs. And you heard from uh, Bert uh, their interest in um, re-engaging with, um, with the US government on these issues. Also, country governments, I think, are now um, uh, more interested in this, in, in this subject, family planning, reproductive health. Um, but the environment in general um, is much better than it's been uh, at least since 1992 uh, and perhaps even, um, even ever, perhaps. Um, just in terms of achievements that we've made in family planning, we have success stories in every region of the world. In Latin America, most countries have graduated from bilateral uh, assistance or in the process of graduating. In a few years, we will be focused only on uh, three countries in Latin America, uh, Haiti, Guatemala, and Bolivia. We've uh, also graduated various countries in North Africa and in uh, Asia, particularly East and Southeast Asia. So our focus now is on the um, poorest countries of the world in Africa and South Asia. In terms of um, the biggest challenge facing uh, our program going forward, uh, I would say it's still revitalizing commitment and attention to family planning reproductive health, both internationally and at the country level, uh, especially in the poorest countries of the world. Um, I think we have the uh, uh, elevated attention and interest in this area. Um, it needs to be um, uh, it needs, it needs to be strengthened moving forward. We also have a challenge of reaching the poor and the underserved. If you look across the countries we work in, uh, it's the poorest countries that have the greatest need for family planning assistance. And within the country, it's the poorest segments of the population that have the greatest unmet need. Um, we need also to uh, focus in on strategies for reaching uh, the poorest. Um, and rural and peri-urban populations. Uh, and one area that needs uh, added attention is community-based approaches, getting outside the clinic. Uh, community-based distributors, outreach programs, mobile clinics, and private sector strategies for reaching um, poor and urban po rural populations. We also need to focus on long-acting and permanent methods. If you look across our successes, uh, particularly in Africa, um, most of it is based on uh, pill and um, injectable contraceptive use. Um, we know, though, that uh, there is growing uh, need for limiting fertility, not just uh, spacing. So as we go forward, we need to figure out creative ways of bringing long-acting and permanent methods uh, to make a wider range of contraceptives available. Uh, throughout Africa, we have uh, contraceptive security issues. We need to focus in on strengthening the availability, improving the availability of contraceptives and strengthening the systems to make them available at the service delivery points. I would add as uh, challenges, uh, repeating um, the minister's point, 
um, the uh, meeting the needs of youth who are often underserved. Um, and there's a special challenge for USAID in addressing needs in Francophone West Africa. If you look across the countries of Africa, the countries that are lagging behind in terms of increasing contraceptive use and availability of con contraceptives, uh, it's largely uh, Francophone um, West Africa that is lagging. We have a special challenge here because we have very few um, missions in the West Africa region. So we need to figure out creative strategies of, of um, uh, addressing needs in countries uh, where we don't have mission presence. Our, um, just to end on a positive note, I think there are many opportunities going forward. Um, we have, uh, in addition to having uh, strong support in our administration and um, uh, both a president and a secretary of state that's, that um, speak out passionately about the need to reduce unintended pregnancies and to make family planning more widely available. Um, we have um, family planning and reproductive health included as a priority under the Global Health Initiative, uh, which was announced by the president back in May. Um, that initiative encompasses uh, family planning, reproductive health, maternal child health, and uh, various infectious diseases, including HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, the fact that he placed these under a uh, single initiative rather than creating uh, two new initiatives for family planning, maternal child health, signals his interest in ensuring that we uh, integrate these programs uh, to the extent uh, uh, practical. And there are many areas where we can do uh, integrated programming in ways that advance uh, family planning and maternal child health and HIV, those th three in particular. Um, family planning, as we know, is a um, important uh, intervention for reducing maternal mortality and reducing child mortality. It's also an important intervention for uh, reducing HIV transmission. All of those are goals under the Global Health Initiative. Uh, we also have seen increased funding for family planning reproductive health, um, about an $80 million increase uh, last year, potentially another $80 million increase uh, next year uh, with um, higher uh, funding requests going forward. So um, I think it's a time to be um, very upbeat about the possibilities for um, reinvigorating family planning reproductive health with USA, U.S. leadership. Uh, and I think other um, uh, donors and um, uh, foundations uh, will join together with the uh, U.S. government in uh, moving this initiative forward. Um, I might, might also just mention, too, uh, in terms of opportunities going forward, we have a number of <clears throat> new technologies that may become available <clears throat> in the next few years. One is um, a new delivery system for uh, Depo-Provera, uh, Depo in Uniject, which will make uh, Depo-Provera much easier to administer and much easier to get um, to make available in um, rural and peri-urban uh, settings going forward. Uh, maybe a couple of years behind, Depo and Uniject will have available um, the contraceptive vaginal ring, uh, which is a one-year ring being developed by the Population Council. It's a women-controlled method, will, uh, as I said, will last for a year, and uh, we see real um, uh, prospects for increasing uh, use of family planning services with these uh, new methods. Um, so let me stop there and um, yield to my next, uh, the next speaker. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, Scott. So I think next we'll have uh, Musimbi Kenyano from, or uh, you guys work it out? Okay, yeah. <laughs> you, you, guys, you guys figured it out for me. Okay, Oyang, we're gonna turn the floor over to Oyang then next. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I'm an optimist. I see uh, three um, major trends uh, happening as we speak. The first trend, is that the decline for family planning reproductive health resources, which has been happening since the mid-1990s, has been reversed. Um, up to 2006, it's been declining, but we have now seen numbers in 2007, 2008, 2009, in which this long decline 
in resources allocated to family planning and reproduction may have been reversed. Um, I was looking at the report of 16 um, NGOs from Europe working together under countdown 2015, and I was shocked, literally, to see um, the new numbers coming out in terms of appropriations from Europe for family planning reproductive health uh, coming out last year, and even maybe the numbers coming out um, in, in the coming uh, year despite the um, um, economic um, uh, crisis. So on the issue of resources, uh, it seems like something is happening in the sense that this long decline has been reversed. And we see it here in the U.S. too, that not accounting for inflation, I think you, the U.S. government has allocated the largest absolute amount for family planning ever in its history. The second one is a major trend towards more effective and better policies. And I think here in the U.S. we have seen that. The rescission of the Mexico City policy, the new guidelines on PEPFAR, and some of the new changes in policies that I've also seen in Europe. And the third one is um, one area which uh, I th I th I'm also positive and optimistic, a little bit uh, cont controversial. And this is the, the long era of self-censorship in the sense that this community has not talked about family planning and population, but talked only about largely sexual reproductive health and rights uh, and forgotten about family planning, which was in the ICPD, population issues, which were also in the ICPD. Uh, I think that the space, the democratic space for bringing those issues has become um, better uh, worldwide, that many of us in different communities can now talk about family planning, can now talk about population within the rights perspective, and at the same time talk about sexual reproductive health and rights. You've seen Bert Conder's talk there. I was monitoring his speech in November 2008. He delivered in Rotterdam. This was when he announced the increase for reproductive health supplies to UNF UNFPA from 5 million euro to 30 million euro and a huge investment they have uh, in, in Yemen. And for a Dutch minister to talk about family planning, population, security, maternal health, all in the same speech, and tried to put them all together, was unprecedented. The Dutch don't talk about population in the past. They don't talk about security issues in the past. But for him, to put those issues in a very coherent way was an eye-opener for me. And I think many of the Europeans are also looking at this issue in a much more uh, comprehensive way. So family planning and reproductive health, as he, uh, Bert, has mentioned, we are a victim of our own success, or relative success, if I may qualify that. Uh, first, in the 1960s to about this time, we know that completed family size, roughly your TFR, has fallen from about average of six in developing countries to an average of three. That's a huge decline. And if you look at the contraceptive prevalence rate, it has increased you know, from 10% in the same time period to about 55% today. And that does not and excluding China, that's probably a little bit lower. But even if you take a 50% CPR, remember that you could never have 100% contraceptive prevalence in any given country. Maybe the highest you will achieve is probably 80%, and that's extremely high already. So at 50%, you're already two-thirds of the way. In other words, it has become a norm, a social norm. It's not controversial anymore in many of those countries. Okay. Let me take the case of Indonesia, for example. In 1997, Indonesia suffered through its most severe economic crisis. Everybody predicted that the family planning program in Indonesia would decline. Because no budgets, government money would not be available, and yet what happened? 
contraceptive prevalence in Indonesia in the worst economic crisis as measured by DHS actually increased in terms of modern CPR. Why? Of course, there are many reasons. But the primary reason, I believe, is that the norms in those districts and provinces were in place, that the people would seek for those services from the private sector or wherever they are, wherever they are because the norms are, are there. They are not controversial anymore. I'd probably cite one country uh, which many of you may be shocked to know. Take the case of Zimbabwe. If you look at every single health indicator, poverty indicator in Zimbabwe, it's all going down. Right, Scott? Mm -hmm. And yet there's one measure where it's going up. CPR. In a place like Zimbabwe. To what can you explain that? All other indicators are going down. To me, again, you know, it's the norms that have been in place, you know, in those countries. And the people, once, you know, they have valued those norms, will seek the services wherever they come from. But this relative success um, blinds us from the fact that if you study 49% of the least developed among the developing countries, the modern CPR is only about 24%, according to UNDP Population Office, Population Division. It's very low. And if you look at Africa, Africa seems to have not been affected by this demographic revolution in a way, if you may want to call it that way. By 2050, we will see an increase of about 2 billion people residing in the continent of Africa. 2 billion people. India would be around 1.7 billion and stabilizing. China would be around 1.5 billion stabilized. And Africa would be at 2 billion and still growing. And some of the most fragile and um, countries which have very serious economic and development issues. So while we have relative success, and the relative success has gotten or taken off family planning and reproductive health off the map, I think there's still unfinished major business uh, in this sector. We at the Gates Foundation believe that without revitalizing the global agenda for family planning and reproductive health, and investing in making sure that the other donors around the world and emerging donors and other players invest in this area, it would be impossible, if not difficult, difficult if not impossible, to achieve the health millennium development goals, and probably even beyond the health goals. If you take a look at some of the studies um, I'm looking here at the Guttmacher Institute, the work done by Vlasov. Just addressing unmet need in the 60 million annual unintended pregnancies in the developing world, you could reduce maternal mortality by 31%. 31% is your single biggest cost-effective intervention to reduce maternal mortality. If you take a look at infant mortality, the same study shows 22%. So again, here, it's a major cost-effective intervention to reduce infant mortality. If you take the case of HIV AIDS, where we know that a huge number of pregnant women in Africa actually don't want to get pregnant when they are HIV positive. It's 90 to 92 percent, but many of them uh, don't have access to family planning contraceptives and services. The Family Health International um, made some studies, and between 1999 to 2006, contraception averted more than 10 times the number of HIV-infected pediatric cases in sub-Saharan Africa 
compared to providing ARV drugs alone to pregnant mothers. So you could actually help achieve your goals in pediatric cases by investing in family planning, not just by providing um, the drugs. So we believe that without a serious reinvestment and revitalization of the family planning global agenda, it would be very difficult for the world to achieve the Millennium Development Goals in maternal health, in infant mortality, in HIV AIDS, and even on equality of women. I'm not even talking about population and climate and environment here. Um, I'm not sure if we have a representative from Hewlett Foundation here, but any time now, uh, there will be two articles that I have been informed will be coming out in a journal soon. I thought, in fact, it has come out already. Um, one is uh, done by a climatologist, and the conclusion is that investments in family planning, reproductive health, is equivalent to at least one and probably two wedges out of the 14 wedges in the Princeton study in order to reduce carbon emissions by half. One, most likely two wedges out of the 14 wedges. I'm not an expert in this area, but I heard that one or two wedges is equivalent to all of us driving electric cars. Just look at the comparison in terms of cost effectiveness. And another study, uh, which was done by a, an economist who used to work with the bank and now with one of the NGOs, um, has concluded that the most cost effective intervention on climate change was, in fact, family planning and girls' education. I'm looking forward to the publication of those studies because. I think the studies which were done with highly sophisticated methodology and very respectable people would probably contribute to the literature and the evidence in the discussion that we have um, today. So I'm very positive that the last year and a half and the future years, I think you will see a revitalization of this agenda from the north to the south among the South, within the foundations, among the, don the donors, and we can talk again about population, family planning, re reproductive health, and essentially have a unified community. Because a precondition, as uh, Professor Shipman did in his uh, study about effective advocacy, which was published in The Lancet, the first precondition of effective advocacy in which you can get the resources that you need. You know, like he did study the HIV AIDS, uh, our friends in the HIV AIDS community and our friends in the malaria community is unity within the community. And I think if we achieve that, you, you, that kind of unity that our other colleagues have been able to achieve, the resources that are sorely needed for family planning reproductive health in order for us to achieve, help achieve the Millennium Development Goals, I think we have, we have uh, a better chance this time around. So thank you for now. Thank you very much. And, and certainly, last but not least, Masimbi Kenyaro from Packard Foundation. Simbi, please. Thank you. When you speak, when everybody has spoken, you want to say, all has been said, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> but I speak from the vantage point of a foundation that has been committed for nearly 45 years in the reproductive health and has stayed committed for that long. So the perspective that I want to bring, which is grounded in the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, are the implications that we need to have in family planning, in thinking long and thinking big. Because the times in which we live are times in which we value quite quick harvests. But we know that when we work with family planning, it's a long-term agenda. It's an agenda of today and tomorrow and the years to come. And I think what we can illustrate by the funding, the grant making that we make in, in our foundation, 
is that kind of long-term commitment and what it yields in learning both to the field and specifically to the issue that we are dealing with. So first of all, I say thanks to all the speakers that have spoken before and for the facts that they have given, I agree with them and I had them in my points and so I will skip them and move on. <laughs> so what have we learned from 45 years of commitment to family planning as a foundation that we could bring and say it really needs to be reflected in the future? One is it is important, it is important to build the capacity of the civil society that are holding fort, holding fort when we achieve success and also maintaining the ground when sometimes that success is threatened. But the different political uh, uh, eras that we can go through, through different social eras that we can go through, and different individual times that we can go through. And this has been the case in the area of family planning. I think as has been outlined by my two previous speakers, there are ups and downs in commitment. But the, at the present time where we are in the area of family planning, we know what works. We know that we can make family planning available to everybody in every place if we committed ourselves to it. And commitment includes not just the will to do it, but to commit resources to it. So in our 45 years, one of the areas that we have found that have been, has been fluctuating over and again is the funding of the resources. And I think the advocacy for the future must include a really sustained effort for advocacy, for sustained funding resources. Because the funding of the resources or the resource uh, availability affects the supply chains, it's, it affects the human resources, if we look at the era that we have passed when HIV was better funded than family planning, what happened is that the, there was a flight of the people that specialized in family planning into the HIV area that so much needed people, but at the same time it meant that it left family planning poorer than it was supposed to do. We can name country after country, but we can also tell in those countries where we have been deeply involved, because the Packard Foundation brings the examples of working deep and long in countries where we are. The 45 years here in the USA, the 10 years in Nigeria, India, Pakistan, bring example after example of saying stay long and, and sustain the people that you are funding for a longer time, a long time. The second thing that I mentioned was the capacity building. In the examples in that, that we have su supported in the Packard Foundation, we have always emphasized the leadership development, growing leaders who are advocates, but also growing leaders who are actually practitioners, planners, budget managers. And we have a caliber of very strong leadership fellows in the countries in which we work. This is important, and as we go into the future, we see the development of the local capacity of leaders and organizations as really a top-notch area that we should look if we have to sustain those gains. We have seen in places where the leadership is not committed to family planning unless you have a caliber of people that call them to accountability. Once again, you lose the momentum that one has on family planning. Telling the stories of the practitioners is very important. In the, in the programs that we work, our success is because organizations, some of which are in these places, have given us data on which we can build uh, credibility to go into the future. Recently, in our evaluation research in India, in Jharkhand, a place quite far, we actually found that through funding Pathfinder and its partners for nearly seven to eight years, we've been, be, been able to see a community raise the delay of the first birth to two and a half years 
that's incredible in the areas in which we work. And having such evidence is very useful for the field and very useful for the donors and very useful also for the governments of those particular places to really see that the needle is being moved in one place. We can give examples of the work that we've been finding over the years in Ethiopia for community workers, which now is a fam it's famous work. That is the people who are able to deliver from house to house information about family planning or holistic information about health. As now governments all over the world look at health systems and uh, look at uh, service delivery and um, caretakers, uh, we see that this example that we began at the grassroots has really yielded something that you can show. You can be able to lift up and show. And we can be able to tell the number of grantees that we worked in, in, in Ethiopia in the beginning years in order to develop that uh, community-based activities and supporting them. So that's another example that we would like to, to lift up. The challenge for us as we go into the future is to how to work collaboratively so that we can bring things to scale. I come from Africa and I know that we can literally grow anything. We can have every small project to be able to succeed. But really difference is when those programs are brought to big scale. So part of our collaboration, I think, with big bilateral uh, donors, like USID or DFID or the Dutch uh, government and others, is really beginning the talk right at the level of the experiment. I think private money is really good for paving the way. But I think that private money and government money is really what makes the biggest difference in scale. And I think this is an area that we should go into the future, really ready to cultivate to the maximum so that things can be brought to scale and examples can last for a long time. Sustainability is important. And I see that as one of the things that we, would do in the, we need to do in the future. The biggest challenges that I see we are going to be facing together, collectively, is in five years' time, can we be able to, f to deliver really on the MDG5, maternal health, and MDG5B, universal access to contraceptives? I think the ch there's a big challenge there. And this is an opportune time because the climate is right, but it really means working much harder to get this MDG uh, delivered properly. The second thing that I think is going to be a challenge is that there are still 200 million women out there with unmet needs. And we cannot, we cannot forget the unmet need is a big area that we should look at. Today I think we can talk of this as a human right. It's a human right. They, that unmet need needs to be met. And it can be met by not just repositioning, but really also inventing at this particular time, even new technologies that, that is actually more easier for women in low resource areas to be able to use pills, what is available, are good and fine and are utilized now more than ever before. But we need um, some like three months, four months uh, kind of contraceptives that women in the low resource areas can use. Then the area where we in the Packard Foundation think that we want to really experiment with because we see a lot of potential. We want to experiment with um, um, linking reproductive health with the, the girls' education, being at the same table with people who fund education and really making sure that education is part of the agenda of our family planning. The second area is taking seriously the voice of women in leadership position. This morning I visited the SEDPA training of women repositioning family planning, and I saw in that room women leaders who are going to make a difference, who are going to speak for themselves from the countries where they are coming from, and who are going to be able to, to, to actually name their own demand and touch the hearts of many in their advocacy work. This is an area that we think has a lot of potential for the future, because it also helps to link the family planning agenda with also the other agendas that are affect or affect communities in which we work. And finally, we will continue to focus our work 
in some specific countries, but specifically take a good look at what ha is happening in sub-Saharan Africa so that we can be able to address some of those areas that are, uh, uh, have bring, uh, are the weakest in the link. And in this area, it's not uh, just a matter of being present there, but a matter of doing really high level advocacy, such as a planned advocacy that we hope to do with the Gates Institute um, to make sure that these messages go across, not just one country, but several countries, and even, if possible, benefit from interregional work this is going to be very, very important for us as we go into the future. And I think that other things will be able to come in as we interact with you and with the questions from the question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosina. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, all three of you here. And of course, Minister Kenders for his video brought some of these same issues to the table. We'll have a, a chance for a little conversation here among, among the, the three of you and then rich set of questions, I'm sure, from such a distinguished field. I'd like to pick up on Masimbi's point about the roles of collaboration between the private and the public, and particularly that notion of the private as the experimental and the pilot, and the public sector coming in and, and helping bring it to scale. And I wondered if, if Oyang or Scott, you'd like to reflect on that, that model and or other models that you see as um, productive directions that uh, we go in, whether it's co-funding or divide and conquer between the public and, and private um, avenues. Let me just say, um, what one of the uh, principles of our uh, Global Health Initiative is um, a focus on system strengthening. And when we talk about system strengthening, um, often we think of government systems. And government systems are, are critical for providing family planning, maternal child health services, but it's not the only system. Uh, so when you look at a country system, you need to look at both the uh, public sector, the private sector, and the NGO sector. And not just to view them as independent of each other, but they're interrelated. And the ideal is when the uh, government recognizes the private sector, the NGO sector as partners and uh, develop strategies that incorporate the contributions of private sector and public sector and acts in ways that improves the environment for private sector uh, investments and involvement. We know that uh, when we, uh, I mentioned we've graduated quite a number of countries uh, from family planning assistance uh, and almost uniformly where we graduate countries it's, is where there is a strong private sector providing services to those who can pay. The government is focused on those who, uh, who can't uh, pay. And there's an NGO sector that's involved in either providing services or uh, providing advocacy also um, on the outside. So those three elements are critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Gates in some ways has the potential to play both those roles, uh, ex supporting experiment but also helping with scaling up. I think when you use the word uh, private, two things uh, come to mind. First, uh, foundations as private sector. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting that a research was conducted jointly by a, both a Democratic and a Republican um, consulting research firm. And one of the conclusions in that research on family planning in the U.S., family planning reproductive in the U.S., among voters and among policymakers was that if the U.S. government is perceived to be in partnership with foundations in the U.S., there would be much more likely voter support for family planning and reproductive health if that is perceived by the public and policymakers. So that's very interesting that the partnership between the U.S. government and the foundations are perceived by both policymakers and voters as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. It adds value uh, mm -hmm. one to the other. The second one is the real private sector, um, the commercial private sector. Again, uh, since I'm familiar with the data, let me, let me use the case of um, Indonesia. In 1986, um, Minister Haryono Suyono, many of you probably know him, said that at that point in time, in 1986, 
Indonesia is already one of the most successful family planning programs in the world. But he said, I want to see my country and my people 20 years from now to be self-reliant in the use of family planning. And I want them to pay for those contraceptives, except maybe for the 20% who are really poor, then we could subsidize. Help us make this happen. Because we are successful, but it's government dominated, it's government funded. If you look at Indonesia today, and this is not uh, kind of popular data, um, you will be actually shocked at the data because they have actually far exceeded that dream that Tariano had 20 years ago or 25 years ago. If you look at the top two methods in Indonesia, the first method, popular method in Indonesia, is injectables. The second is the pill. I asked a colleague from the Rand Corporation, I said, could you take, could you run some studies on who are the people who are actually paying for this? 99% of those who are using injectables in pills in Indonesia pay full commercial price. The rich and the poorest pay full commercial price. Whether they get it from the physician, they get it from the midwives, they get it from the pharmacy, or they get it from some, or even get it from the government post. Because the government post also charge as part of their um, cost recovery program. So to me, I said, wow, the poorest of the poor, the poor up to the rich people pay, almost all of them, 99%, pay at the same full commercial price. If it can happen in Indonesia among the poor, why could not it happen? Maybe Indonesia is unique, but maybe there are other countries where this can also happen. But why did it happen in Indonesia? Probably a lot of factors. Again, political commitment, commitment and a strategy to really shift the program away from the government-dominated, government-funded into a much more self-reliant program with the use of the private sector, not social marketing, but working directly with the commercial um, private sector. So I, I think that the private sector can play a large role, although many in our sector don't believe in that, <coughs> But my own personal experience has shown that, in fact, it can play a critical role in a self-sustaining, effective family planning program. Mm -hmm. okay. Terrific. Well, let me ask, uh, we had a, a couple of you, obviously, the Minister and, um, and Basimbi, talk about the MDGs. And uh, perhaps it's a bias of sitting in Washington, and perhaps it's reflecting heavily towards the last eight years rather than the future years, but that hasn't necessarily been a frame that has animated at least the Washington policy discussion. Is that changing? Is that a, a hook upon which we can measure progress? In, in this is, I guess, obviously a, a question for Scott, but also in terms of as, as the foundations kind of have uh, obviously based in the U.S. and lots of focus on the U.S. Uh, funding sources and policy environment, but in collaborating with others, say, in Europe and some of the other countries that you're working in, where the MDGs seem to resonate more. Is that something that we s will see as an increasingly useful tool in measuring, um, uh, a way to measure our progress? I think from a uh, USAID standpoint, in the, as you, you're right, in the last eight years, um, the MDGs weren't a real focal uh, point for our work. Um, even though we were working in those areas that affected the MDGs, but it really wasn't part of our um, uh, organizational framework. I think the new administration is changing that, where, and the MDGs are a focus. So I think we will be speaking more frequently in terms of uh, our contributions to the MDGs, and, um, and I think speaking a, a language that's more common across um, other donors and uh, the countries we work with. Mm -hmm. I think it's fr important to frame this debate within the MDGs because we work with countries and focus mm -hmm. countries in the South who find uh, international instruments as very important to, to create a debate around it. Both the advocates and even government's financing sometimes is done according to these agreed instruments. And definitely the MDGs with the focus on um, reducing poverty 
is very important for the southern governments because poverty is a big issue. And the rest of the MDGs really are uh, lined along so that they, they, they speak together, they go as a unity. And being able to lift up the centrality and the importance of the MDG 5 uh, maternal health and universal access to reproductive health is extremely important. In financing, I think that when we look at, um, at, at it and look at other declarations that have been made by governments uh, in various places, the MDG can also help to try and say, yes, you have a health finance, but how much of this is on actually MDG 5 or MDG 2 or MDG 3 according to whatever that one wants to, because then you can be able to see the segregation of financing, and another, that is another important thing. And then I think the civil society uses these MDGs to call their own governments to accountability. So there is a way in which having some frame that we can all use globally can be very useful. That, that's a really good question, Jeff. Uh, my own personal experience is that before, when I started to link um, family planning reproductive health as a critical and essential component of achieving the MDGs, people laughed in the beginning and said, what are you talking about? You know, in the US, nobody thinks in terms of the MDGs. And I said, but it's the most effective way of doing it. But now the world has changed. Um, within the Gates Foundation, for example, our president in, all our, in many of our staff meeting always say, whatever we do, whatever investments we have in the area of global health, we must look at it in terms of what our contributions are in achieving the health MDGs. And if you remember, um, Bill Gates was uh, one of the speakers at the UN General Assembly meeting, I think, last year. And he gave them the MDG goals an A+, plus in the sense you know, that the world community has come together and agreed on a common good and agreed to be monitored against progress towards that common good. Um, when this research that I mentioned uh, in the US was conducted by both these Republican and Democratic consulting firms, in the beginning I said, could you check whether linking family planning, reproductive health to MDGs would make sense? Mm. And they said, what are you talking about? You know, people in the US don't think in terms of MDGs or Ying. I said, just test it. Because, that's, because the advocacy strategy that we have revolves around that. And they were completely surprised that if you define the MDGs to the voters as a common good that the world has agreed upon, and don't use the word MDGs, but use the word having poverty, universal access to primary education, mm -hmm. decreasing uh, maternal mortality, saving mothers' lives, you know, decreasing infant mortality, saving babies' lives, that, of course, they do understand. And if you link family planning in relation to the achievement of that common good, the voters are intelligent. They do understand that. The policymakers do understand that. But that would not be an issue in Europe because in, as far as I know, uh, in talking to all um, our friends and colleagues there, both in the donor community and the NGO community, they are so stiff mm -hmm. in the language of the MDGs mm -hmm that they're like what Dr. Kanyuru said, you know, they look at many of the things that they do and their investments in ODA in terms of their contribution to achieving the Millennium Development Goals. Terrific, that's very helpful. Well, it's tempting to continue asking my questions, but I know this is a very august group that <laughs> uh, will revolt here shortly if I don't turn the floor over to them. So why don't we do that? A reminder, because we are webcasting it, that I would like you to wait for one of my colleagues to come to you, if you could, uh, to use the microphone, if you could let us know who you are and uh, get, make a, a short, concise question um, and um, pose it to the panel. That would be terrific. So who would like to to kick us off? Margaret, why don't we, Margaret Noise, give you the first question. Thank you very much. This has been really interesting to hear your thoughts on future and where we're going. But I also noticed that none of the three who spoke with us actually addressed the first issue that 
um, the gentleman from Netherlands posed, which was, what about youth and adolescence? Um, having been involved at AID on trying to deal with and address the adolescent issue and the challenges of that, I would like to hear what the thinking is now as you look into the future and the possibilities and the opportunities that a new administration and a new perspective perhaps might present, both from the foundation side as well as the bilateral side. What are the possibilities of really taking this on and really addressing the unmet need of the millions and billions now of adolescents that are coming into reproductive age? I can give you a provisional answer to that question. <laughs> Um, because we are still um, mapping out what the Global Health Initiative is and what it encompasses. I can say that the administration came in with uh, youth at, uh, on its agenda, saying what do we need to do to uh, uh, advance um, not just reproductive health, but also the um, education and how, do we, how, do, how can we adopt a youth focus that will um, attend to the uh, special needs there. So uh, I think we will be uh, dealing with youth in a more uh, direct, maybe open way than we have in the past. And, uh, but exactly what that means in term programmatically, uh, it's too soon to say. We've, uh, we've organized a number of uh, working groups that are developing the, uh, the, the framework for the Global Health Initiative, uh, which is supposed to be concluding its activities um, um, uh, in, in December. So we'll know of a more definitive answer then. I can give you a sure answer for the Packard Foundation that adolescent reproductive health has been part of our programs and will continue to be part of our programs because uh, that's where the story begins. Uh, that's where we need to be. And in countries that we have worked in, yes, I heard from um, our uh, program persons who've been working in Ethiopia the 10 years ago when they began adolescent reproductive health, working with the um, different uh, partners such as Save the Children. It was a very sensitive issue. But today, people have accepted it. And so what we have done, like recently we made um, a strategic decision to do some grant making in Rwanda not because Rwanda needs grant making, but specifically because they are doing very well in the direct family planning, but not so well in adolescent sexual reproductive health, and in also bringing to the table the issues of post-abortion care and access in those areas. Yet there's quite a lot of death that comes, not only from adults, but also from young people that has got um, uh, abortion-related issues. So we're gonna be working with them in that particular place on research to provide the evidence that they need to, to go to, uh, to have uh, youth issues and uh, all of these other issues addressed, but also use our experience of working very cooperatively with the, the civil society movement as well as the government in Ethiopia to see whether we can bring that knowledge to Rwanda as well. Yeah, uh, three, three things, uh, Margaret. Um, we don't have a specific adolescent youth program in our strategy, but we address it three ways. Uh, first, for example, we have funded Pathfinder International to conduct a feasibility study for global advocacy and um, adolescent reproductive health. I, um, I think they're at the end in terms of uh, making a report on that feasibility study. Second, um, we have made it a component of our urban investments in the four to five um, uh, priority country programs in which we invest at the country level. Um, so it is a, a component of that, and we allow that to be funded under the country actions. And the third area, under our strategy and learning agenda, um, we have a special place for delayed first birth and delayed um, marriage. And in that context, we can bring in the adolescent reproductive health issues as part of the learning agenda, which is essentially conducting more research and learning, you know, in, in, in that area. Okay.
Terrific. Why don't we just go right up this row right here, and, and what we'll do, we'll have to switch because I know we're going to have a lot of questions. We'll gather a couple and then give you guys a chance to respond. So why don't we just go straight up four in a row there. Hi, I'm Kathy Hall with the UN Foundation. Um, and I had a question for the three of you um, concerning what I think that you all would regard as a positive um, U.S. policy change that happened uh, recently, which is that the administration and Congress got behind U.S. funding for UNFPA again um, after a long hiatus. Could you say something about your thinking about um, your organization's collaboration with, with UNFPA and what its global mandate is in this big space? And um, I think relatedly, I guess we all know that in 2011, there'll be a new um, head of UNFPA. Um, what would be a couple of bullet points that you would be starting to think about for her or him as um, that person is taking on a new, a new um, agenda? Okay, if you could hand it to Rachel right behind there. Thank you. I'm Rachel Nugent from the Center for Global Development. I have uh, one question for the, any, any or all of the panelists and then one uh, quick comment in response to something that Oying said. Um, Scott raised the challenge of integrating service delivery. And I'd like to pose the question of how much we know about integrating with what is the primary killer of women in the world today, except in the poorest countries, but in developing countries, and that's chronic diseases, uh, even among reproductive age women. And that's the direction that uh, the epidemiological transition is moving, of course. So my question is, given that we now know there's very strong biological link between uh, uh, intrauterine environment and uh, the uh, natal, prenatal and, and natal conditions that women experience and the chronic disease risk of their children as well as their own later in life chronic disease risks and the possibility of achieving just overall better health for women if we think about how to integrate these kinds of services. What is the perspective for some perhaps pilot research, operations research to better understand how this might work? That's my question. The, the other point is that Toying mentioned some research. I'll just very briefly um, elaborate. Uh, my colleague David Wheeler at the Center for Global Development will yeah. be publishing one of those papers. It should be out uh, very soon. We've finally gotten the last review in, and it will be a matter of weeks. Uh, we'll, we will publish it. Uh, we had a, uh, David spoke and made a presentation on it in June at the center. There's a little bit on our website about it, and there will be more. And to uh, emphasize the point made, in David's work and Brian O'Neill's work, uh, there is very strong evidence that family planning and girls' education are both far more cost-effective interventions to achieve uh, climate uh, emissions, greenhouse gas yeah. emissions reductions than any of the technological uh, types of interventions that are being looked at within the climate change discussion. So um, I don't want to elaborate. It's, uh, it's uh, the work of my colleague. There will be a lot of discussion about it, but I think the challenge and the opportunity for this community, of course, is to think about how to enter into those discussions uh, in a productive way with that, with that research. Thanks. Hazel Denton from Johns Hopkins. One certainly gets the impression this afternoon that we are opening a whole new chapter and there's a lot more optimism. Having said that, my question is, what are the incentives for the donors to improve their cooperation? And are there perhaps some lessons we can learn from the AIDS initiatives? And in that context, how do you see using the new opportunities under PEPFAR? Okay. One more, I promise. It's a long homework assignment here, but go ahead. Da David Nolan from Catholics for Choice. Um, Oying, is something that you mentioned in your early remarks that I want to ask you about. You said you saw as a positive that we'd ended our self-censorship over the issue of population and family planning. Um, for many people, including our organization, the changes in the mid-90s around Cairo and Beijing where we ended the discussion or reduced the discussion around population and made the discussion around reprodu reproductive health much more women-centered was a very positive move because it ended a long period where the North was berating the South about how many people were living there and so on. Um, so I'm just wondering, 
is it really in that game that we start talking about population again? Do we have to put women's rights in a women-centered agenda to one side in order to do that? Um, yeah, that, that, that was my question, thanks. Okay. Terrific, so we have um, UNFPA, Integrating Chronic Diseases, Incentives for do Donor Coordination and Approving It, and um, the question of uh, Cairo and population. Who would like to jump into that fray? <laughs> I'll, I'll start. Uh, on UNFPA, um, along with funding UNFPA f uh, for the first time in eight years, um, we're actually becoming more engaged with UNFPA at a technical level. Now, the, uh, the, in the past eight years, we've worked with them on c a contraceptive security initiative, something called the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, uh, and that produced a forum where we could uh, interact productively on those set of issues. But um, since we've refunded UNFPA, we've, we've actually begun cl collaborating with them on a technical level in a whole variety of areas. I know that uh, family planning, MCH integration, and equity are two areas we've already begun um, collaborating on, and there'll be others going forward. On um, chronic diseases, I think that's something we probably aren't going to get too involved in in the near future. Uh, uh, our Congress, congressional um, um, appropriation uh, focuses our funding on, um, um, on um, infectious diseases, on maternal child health and family planning uh, initiatives, and, and we haven't been able to make uh, progress in working on uh, diseases that affect more advanced uh, countries, um, chronic disease and, diseases and, and injuries. Um, what are the incentives to improve uh, international cooperation? I think the, I mean, the main incentive is having uh, leadership at the top that encourages international cooperation and, um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and focuses attention on it. And I think the Secretary of State uh, has made um, uh, family planning, reproductive health, and the broader health initiatives part of her uh, agenda, um, um, both within U.S. and inter internationally at, at international forum forums. Um, and finally, uh, the women's centers center approach. I don't see. Um, I think it is possible to talk about uh, population issues without sacrificing a women-centered approach in our programming. The programming that we do is, uh, and have been doing, is uh, voluntary family planning. And we have very uh, tight restrictions about ensuring that there aren't any incentives or any coercive aspects to programs that we're involved in. If there are, we can't be a part of them. Uh, I think it's possible to separate them and to say uh, we implement programs with a women-centered women centered approach with a view towards uh, uh, responding to reproductive intentions of women and families, um, and still talk about the importance of doing that for a whole array of reasons. Uh, maternal health, it's important for maternal health, it's important for child health, it's important for reducing abortion, it's important for uh, enabling uh, families to invest in their children, it's important for community uh, and uh, societal development for a whole array of reasons. I think it's possible to talk about that in a way that doesn't uh, lead to coercive uh, programming? Let me begin with that one because I'm a, a proponent of the fact that we couldn't leave the population equation out. There is a difference between hiding something under the table when you know it is there and when it is not there. The truth is that scientifically we know that population does affect development. We know that population does affect the environment, et cetera, et cetera. I was in Cairo and um, I am here today. Some of the things that were important for many groups of people from Cairo are uh, exactly what has become proper knowledge for us today. Coercion was one of those. The second one was developing technologies without including women in the decision making, both of developing these technologies, but also testing out those technologies, especially for women in the South, without their permission, or without even those governments knowing these issues are not good issues and they must be looked after really carefully. But to pretend that population, we can't mention it because southern people or southern governments will uh, go up 
um, in arms, I don't think it's good enough for us to be able to do in the world of today. Because we share the same world, we listen to the same news, we get affected by the same things. I know, practically, I grew up in a village where there was a stream of water running. It is not there today. And people need a lot of water. It's partially environment, partially the growth of population. So I personally feel very strongly that if we want to be honest, subjective, and look at these areas, we need to put them on the table and not be protective of them and then find out how we filter uh, what is right to do and, what, and not do what is wrong to do. So that's one aspect of it, and I, I, I speak very strongly because I think it's a fact. It's a fact. And when we deal with population issues, we also deal with family planning, reproductive health issues, and we have to do it scientifically and well and ethically as well. And then I just wanted to comment on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the one about um, uh, chronic d illness, I think is the same with, with Scott, but the one about UNFPA, I personally feel that in the next generation of the UNFPA leadership, there will be some challenge because now there is a women's agency, there is a children's agency, there is a UNAIDS, etc. And it might just be um, a, a, a asking UNFPA to look at itself once again and say, what its, its niche as it goes into the future with so many agencies focusing particular areas. And I think that the next leadership, whoever she or he is, will have to deal with that issue. Let, let me start with, the, with David Miller and the population issue. Um, I think if we don't engage in this um, discussion, it will be defined by other people with less sensitivity and less concern to rights and ethical issues, and we've, lo we've lost it. That's why we think we need to engage in this. Um, about two or three months ago, um, a group of about 15 people were convened from all over the world um, in, uh, in the UK to precisely address this issue. So they brought in people who look at population issues and brought in the women's rights feminist groups. And the question was asked, I was in that meeting, question was, can we address the population issue under the rights perspective? And it was not even a big debate. I said, of course we can. Of course we can. Why can't we not address the population issue within the rights perspective? In fact, it's interesting that one of the participants who just wrote a book, I'll not mention his name, refused to come to that meeting. And he said, because I've been so criticized every time I use the word population, I'm fed up with it. I don't want to come to these meetings anymore. And he was reassured that this meeting you know, was not going to be that meeting, this, that kind of meeting. So my view is that if we don't engage and define it the way exactly we want to define it by our community, other will people, people will go in there and start defining it in terms of what we don't want them to define it. So that's, um, and if um, at the Berlin meeting, uh, I don't know if Karen Hardy is here, Karen Hardy from PAI was bringing with her the complete copy of the ICPD. And I, w I should have brought it with me, uh, you know, for dramatic purposes, but <laughs> if you look at that ICPD document, and you read it very carefully. I don't know if you have it, Karen. <laughs> There's a long chapter there on population, well written, well crafted, very sensitively written. It's long chapters on family planning. But those two issues just disappeared from the radar map. Some of the research that was done by PEI in legislatures in developing countries, whether we like it or not, many of the male members, parliamentarians, when you talk about family planning, reproductive health in the health context, they don't connect. But when you talk about it in the context of population growth and its impact on employment and schools and labor you know, and all that, then they, they perk up. That we understand. So we need to bring back that community, the debate in that community, so that we can define this exactly the way we think defined you know, within the rights perspective, and with sensitivity to the issues, you know, historically in which this issue has become uh, so sensitive. On the UNFPA, um, I'll be blunt. I'd like to see a new UNFPA which actually address more 
one issue in which they were created, which is population and family planning. If you look at the last report of the UNFP and resource generation, which was then officially uh, adopted by the Commission on Population and therefore by the entire UN system, their report says that the most underfunded part of the Cairo ICPD was family planning. And therefore, we really need you know, to increase funding in family planning. And then all of a sudden, there are only three categories in that budget. Family planning, direct cost, maternal health, direct cost, and then program-related uh, program cost. So I was kind of like, so where did reproductive health go? It disappeared. It's now under maternal health. I think that issue should be raised with UNFPA. If you look at that, um, so in my view, I think, uh, yes, it's good that UNFPA is refunded, but I think you know, that UNFPA, as mentioned, you know, should re-examine you know, in terms of what their um, own priorities um, should be. On the issue of uh, chronic disease, I could not agree with you more. Unfortunately, at this point in time, even us at the Gates Foundation is still not funding this. But I think you raise a very good point, you know. Um, the world is changing. The kind of developing countries that we used to have at the back of our mind is not the kind of developing countries that, that we see right now. The world has changed, and our paradigm may not have shifted yet. So I think um, a research or an investigation in this area is probably um, in order. On the issue of donor coordination, um, you will be surprised to know that this is on uh, family planning reproductive health is only one issue in which there is actually an annual meeting of all the presidents of foundations which are actually funding family planning reproductive health. Mm -hmm. There is no equivalent for other issue specific diseases. So there is actually quite a very good close collaboration between the major um, um, foundations based in the U.S. Uh, we, we call each other all the time, you know, we meet all the time. Uh, we have our president's meeting um, every year on almost a regular basis, and many of these uh, are discussed. And um, I may also say that uh, it's also happening in Europe. You know, we meet with other donors there all the time. We know each other. Um, in fact, um, in the case of the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, uh, most of the European donors, uh, USAID, and uh, foundation donors are all there um, supporting each other. Um, I just came back from, from a meeting in Latvia of the Euro NGOs. Uh, these are all the NGOs in Europe in family planning and reproductive health. And we all talk together in terms of how to support their work, all the different foundations. So in fact, there's a really, really good track record of all the different foundations you know, uh, in the US working with each other. Uh, it's good you mentioned uh, actually the name Brian O'Neill and David Will I was not trying to mention because uh, the articles have not come out. I must just say one thing about that and that analysis that was done by Brian, by Brian, in fact, I was talking to him about this a while back. I said, Brian, your analysis is real, really good in terms of its fund, uh, findings, but you didn't even take the, into consideration the fact that the demographic dividend has already been harvested. So what do you mean by that? I said, there are 400 million West Chinese in the world today. Just imagine if there were 400 million more. What would have been the impact, you know, and and it's not saying that there's, you know, because I was talking actually to the, de the director general of the National Family Planning uh, Office of China at the time when this issue was being discussed at the Bixby Forum for the, the World in 2050, uh, which was hosted by University of California in Berkeley. And I said, uh, Dr. Lin, um, if you did not adapt your controversial, I was joking her, you know, policy in China, how many more Chinese would have been, how many births were averted? Said minimum 300, maximum around 400 million, so it's between 300 and 400 billion. So I said, and this, all this analysis on climate change didn't even take that into consideration. 
He said, yeah, in fact, that's part of our contribution to climate change. You know, so. <laughs> yes, there, we'll be discussing that in New York and Copenhagen, right? OK, yeah. why don't we go to get, collect some more questions in the middle and then a couple in the back. Hi, Nancy Harris from JSI. Um, I'm happy to see a panel with the three organizations I think have been the most creative in programming in family planning. And I'd like to talk about an issue that's not only under the table, but totally ignored by all three agencies. And that's um, refugees, displaced persons, and persons living in severely fragile post-conflict states. Um, there's at least 40 million refugees. The average length of time is 17 years uh, that they're on these places. Plenty of time to reproduce. 70% are women and young people. Um, they have virtually no access to family planning, and um, we're not just talking about relief programs. We're talking about some opportunities for advocacy and for creative thinking on programming, which is what all three of your organizations are good at. Why, why nothing? Why does every grant proposal get a polite decline? Why does USAID not fully engage uh, with their colleagues working on these issues. Okay, and then Sean right there next to you and then we'll go to the back. Hi, I'm Sunita Sharma from Health Policy Initiative Project Futures Group and it's really good to see there's a lot of emphasis on reaching the poor. And I feel like because the needs are much higher, unmet need much higher, DFR much higher, and the use of services much lower. lower. But I think the important part, because most of the issues these people are facing, barriers to access, they are demand side barriers. So it's very important to engage the poor or organizations representing the poor in the process, because they can tell you what are the specific barriers they are facing, and they can also help us in designing solutions. So I think this is a very important intervention when we work on reaching the poor, we actually engage them in the process. Okay, thank you. Sean, if we could do right in the back. Uh, my name is Jack Lawson. I'm with Population Institute. Uh, used to work with Scott. Um, about two generations ago, I entered this field, you know, as trying to help the world, help change the world uh, with the population field. About a generation ago, I thought it might be fun to go out in the commercial field and earn some money. And then, <clears throat> more recently, I had the opportunity to get back into, at least put one foot into the nonprofit world. <clears throat> During that time, the world population doubled. And that was a span of, what, two generations, 35 years or so. Mm -hmm. The question I have is, what are the two things, as we look down to 2050 and look at potential populations ranging, total population ranging from 9 to 12 billion, maybe even more, uh, what would be, as you look forward to then, what would be the two most important things that you are doing that would prevent that, that from happening in that time period? Okay, why don't we get, grab a couple more because I'm cognizant of our time here. And Hi, I'm um, Adrian Allison, and I have to say I also worked with Scott a long time ago. Um, I, uh, two points. First of all, um, I work with World Vision at the moment, and uh, World Vision, um, I didn't know before I joined, uh, it has an annual budget of $3 billion, and it's in 97 countries. Mm -hmm. And this organization never did family planning until we got a grant from USAID two years ago. And I want to just thank you for the return on that investment that you made because World Vision is undertaking a huge child health campaign in this fall, a global campaign funded with millions of dollars and being orchestrated by advertising gurus in London. It was originally just going to be MDG4. Now it's going to be MDG4 and 5. So uh, I want to put a plug in for the universal language of MDGs 4 and 5 because they're the ones that were so appealing to people at World Vision 
who until two years ago thought family planning was abortion. Now they know that family planning saves lives. They all know three to five saves lives. It's like a litany now. <laughs> the other thing I want to add is just to your comment. Uh, World Vision includes, reaches 70 million people in Africa alone, and they're the poorest of the poor. The organization is throughout Africa. At this point, we've had, this is, sorry, I'm grateful for the fact that we had $100,000 but we have 70 million people that we could reach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, why don't we get uh, Suzanne Petroni and Karen Hardy and then we'll give our panelists a chance to. Hi, Suzanne Petroni with the Summit Foundation. Um, we are a foundation and have perspectives on these issues, but we give about a 15th of the uh, Packard Foundation in this area and I don't even wanna venture to guess how much in fraction of the Gates Foundation we give. Um, but just uh, two points. One is just on the issue of donor collaboration. I just wanted to add, um, Oying mentioned that the foundation presidents, uh, at least of I think the five or six large foundations working in this field, meet annually. Uh, but we also have the Funders Network on Population, Reproductive mm -hmm. Health, yeah, and Rights, yeah. where about 60 foundations, um, ranging correct. from groups that give $60,000 a year on up to the Gates Foundation participate. So we have a nice diversity and range uh, of issues that we collaborate on. Um, I wanted to come back, and this will be no surprise, Oying and I had this conversation in Berlin a couple of weeks ago um, to, to the ICPD and its definition of sexual and reproductive health, um, because I think many of us talk about family planning and reproductive health as if they're the same thing, mm -hmm. um, but then complain that family planning never gets talked about. And so I want to come back to what that definition was. and. Um, and remind us that the Cairo definition of reproductive health includes family planning as well as prevention and treatment of STIs, including HIV, uh, prevention and response to gender-based violence, and uh, maternal health, including prevention and treatment of unsafe abortion. Um, and, and so when we talk about attention to and funding for family planning declining since Cairo, um, and I'll just put a plug in, I have a letter in the next, um, international perspectives on sexual and reproductive health that kind of lays this out. I think a lot of donors have reported their family planning funding going for reproductive health. And in fact, funding for reproductive health has increased fivefold since Cairo, partly um, likely because we report it as part of reproductive health. So um, I, I'm just laying that out there to encourage us to be careful about using terms and, and being clear about what we mean and then uh, asking the question, which is uh, USAID's uh, office working on this is called Population and Reproductive Health. So, um, and Packard is now Population and Reproductive Health Program. Gates, I think, has a reproductive health program. Can you just describe what it is you fund under um, the rubric of those programs in that term? Okay, if you could pass it just back to Karen. Yes, hi, uh, Karen Hardy from PAI, and it's a bit of a bit of a follow-on to Suzanne's question, and that is to get back to the Berlin meeting and thank all of you and Musibi, particularly you, for uh, standing up and say, using the word population and even getting booed in the meeting. Um, so thank you for for your courage in doing that. I want to bring us back again to the term family planning because we were family planning was actually in the Berlin call to action demanding that uh, countries support ICPD put family planning in a footnote, and we were told that we were supposed to be happy because family planning was mentioned in a footnote because it's all reproductive health. So I guess the question is, are we losing family planning by just putting it under reproductive health? And you know, one thing to talk about population, but if we can't even use the term, and some of us were told in the sessions, don't use the term family planning, just don't even use it, but then what are we left with if we don't? So I guess just to add to Suzanne's question is, you know, what should we be doing? Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's six. So I even increased it from the four previous. Um, well, you can divide and conquer and pick and choose in terms of how you want to plug into those. But, but Scott, you want to for our final final set of comments? Yeah. Okay. I'll um, maybe start with refugees and displaced uh, populations. We do have um, we have had in the past um, um, uh, devoted central resources to. Uh, uh, developing um, approaches for reaching um, refugees um, and displaced populations with um, 
um, family planning uh, and reproductive health services and with culminated in a, a manual for um, that to guide that um, that intervention the most of the work in this area though falls under our state department uh, PRM population refugees and migration uh, and they in the past have supported reproductive health work um, have they haven't so much the last eight years but I believe they'll be re-engaging in that uh, under the new administration um, Let's see, um, on demand side barriers and working with organizations that help the poor, I think that's a great idea and, uh, and we should be doing, doing that. Um, the, um, on Ad Adrian's comment on the uh, world vision and the importance of a focus on the MDGs uh, four and five, but my only comment there is that I always wonder, the uh, 5B came along late in the process in 2007, I think was what was said. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, because of the uh, um, the headline for that MDG is is uh, maternal health. I'm not sure if the B doesn't get lost sometimes. So it's it's we need. Okay, it's fine. Okay, we need to be sure that that when people talk about MDG five, that they um, include include five B now that it's there. Um, Let's see, on um, reproductive health, um, for USAID, um, the vast majority of our resources go towards family planning and related um, uh, issues surrounding family planning, uh, although we, we do have um, uh, some level of resources that is, that is uh, dedicated to uh, gender-based violence, uh, post-abortion care, um, FGC, uh, fistula, and um, a focus on um, increasing age at marriage. So we do talk about and, and do other things than family planning, although family planning is the main focus of our work. And um, on Jack's question of the two things, I may I'll come back to that. Let me think about that some more. Um, okay. Let me pass it on. I should say, we also have a reception afterwards. So okay. Scott, if you don't yeah. think of it until you've had a drink in your hand, that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll just comment on, on um, uh, two of them. 2050, what are the two most important things that uh, we should, from my perspective, I think uh, uh, the two is family planning that meets the unmet need of uh, uh, women that really would require or do want to manage their own fertility. I think this is really foremost. It should be important. And the second one that I think uh, is going to be important is investing in, in some strong aspect of demand. And uh, I think that the evidence coming on us uh, scientifically really says that something that links girls' education. In our program at the Packard Foundation, we've decided to do some investment that um, we're experimenting. We have to see how within the short resources, that the, the, few, the resources that we have, how we can be able to address the girls between the age of 12 and 18. And we think that this is part of the future investment on um, the demand side on, on what to do and be together with the people that are worrying for the health and the uh, adolescent sexuality of these girls as well as their education. So that's, those are the two things, if I had to name the two things from one of the persons who asked the question. The other question was in, uh, in, in the naming. Um, uh, last year, the Packard Foundation, together with the Gates Foundation, we collaborated and put out a, um, a research on the terminologies that we use in the area uh, that we work. And believe me or not, we have so many terminologies that people sometimes who are not familiar with what we are so saying just get lost of what we really mean by family planning, reproductive health, sexual reproductive health, and so on and so forth. And so one of the areas we are really focusing is, is uh, trying to see some of our partners who are working together with us and asking, now there are a lot of really good, clear messages that show return on investment in regards to family planning saves lives or whatever it is, et cetera. But how can we be able to get in the reproductive health community or in the family planning community or population studies, get some common vocabulary that so that when people who are also in the corporate world, in the policy makers, in governments, in other non-reproductive health mainland, in uh, human rights organizations, in social organizations, entrepreneurs, engineers, and media. How does a media person cover us? What do we really mean by every terminology? And I think the challenge 
comes back to us in the field to develop some, uh, uh, some comprehensive messages that are sufficiently uh, defined what we are going. When Susan mentioned what was defined in Cairo under sexual reproductive health, it was a chain of things. So you can say, and really what happened with the budget was that the emphasis of the monies that were available for the reproductive health are HIV and AIDS funding. So one of those things got funding. And so you would have to go on the list in order to isolate and see who got, uh, uh, what, what really suffered from it. And very often uh, it's been identified as the direct family planning that did suffer from that equation. And then the one on, on refugees, uh, I come from a continent that has really had a, 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 an experience of refugees. And in my former life, I worked very closely with many women in refugee areas. In fact, the last assignment that I had was to have a meeting with women in Dafu, uh, coming from Dafu in the refugee camps in, 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 in um, Chad. Uh, in my previous lives, I worked in many uh, refugee camps, both in Africa and also visited many refugee camps in Middle East. I know what you're talking about. And women in those places do need the presence of family planning. In fact, some people almost think that when people are in refugee camps that they are suffering so much that they, they don't have sex. It's not true. Some have got a willing sex, and there is also very um, uh, sophisticated, unwilling sex that happens, a lot of rape that happens in refugee camps, and a lot of uh, 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 trade for things that people need. And so I just heard your story. Um, I know that from our foundation, we do not distinguish it by that this group of people, we will not find them, but when they are within the geographies and the areas that we work, we pay attention to them. There was a question there about making sure that we hear from the people who are um, the poor or the people that are being served. I couldn't agree with you. And I think that uh, in our foundation, one of the strongest part of our, our foundation is that we do have a team of people that we call country advisors that come from that country who set up offices in those countries that really bring back the story for us and identify what is the best way for us to invest and fund. And they know the place they are trusted with the place and we trust them. Thank you. Uh, Nancy, if you can get uh, Angelina Jolie and George Clooney at the same time to raise this issue as part of the larger refugee, I think we might get some traction. Um, I think you, have, you just simply have to keep on making the case. As uh, many of our colleagues, for example, in Asia and Latin America, they always complain, you know, all the attention of the donors have been shifted to Africa. What about all the unmet need in Asia? What about all the unmet need in Latin America? What about the needs of refugees, you know? So my answer to that is you got to make the case, and you have to continue to advocate about that until you finally get, get traction. Yeah. Um, and uh, Sunita's uh, main point, I think you raised a very, very good point, and I could not agree more, uh, that the demand side, and especially understanding the needs of the poor, even contraceptive needs of the poor, you know, should really be um, taken very seriously. In fact, we, have, we do make um, investments in that, in researching uh, the demand side of that, including uh, research on the target profile of new contraceptives. Um, for Jack's um, point, my answer to that is yes, invest in family planning. That would be my answer. But, but beyond that, um, investment in saving mothers' lives and babies' lives is also important because when more mothers' lives and children's lives are actually saved, you know, the, the, the demand for more children reduces, but also the need for family planning increases at the same time because how else would you do it? If you have to have less, less children, then you have to, to practice family planning. But there's one area that uh, it's not a direct investment, but we take it very seriously at the Gates Foundation. It is that we use our voice and our own investment in trying to convince other donors um, to, to put more money and revitalize this agenda. So whether it's in Europe or um, in other emerging donors, we try to put investment in that. We believe, for example, at this point in time, that with a new government in Japan, it's worth looking into the 
Japanese angle once again and see whether we can get traction there in terms of family planning, reproductive health, or even global health, you know, uh, in terms of increased ODA from the second largest uh, provider of uh, ODA uh, in the world. Um, to Adrian's point about world vision, I, I think, yes, we need more faith-based uh, partners uh, in this field and uh, globally, globally too. Uh, Suzanne always uh, raised the more um, difficult <laughs> issues. Um, let me just respond, you know, at least from the point of view on our side. We do, fa in fact, fund HIV AIDS. It's kind of like that's part of reproductive health, but it has more money than family planning. We do, in fact, fund maternal and neonatal. We just approved, you know, our strategy five-year strategy on maternal, neonatal, and child health, and it has more money on family planning. Um, and gender-based violence are all addressed in many of the programs uh, that we do fund. So the question really is, um, in all of this, what is family planning you know, in terms of funding? And your point is that if the European governments allocate money for reproductive health, we don't really know how much of that reproductive health money goes to family planning. And it's very difficult to know. Even now, um, most of the funding, there's a trend uh, in most uh, of Europe, not the US, uh, fortunately, that more money is going into this so-called basket funding or general support rather than to issue specifics. So when a member of parliament, for example, in the UK, asks, you know, DFID and said, so how much are we spending in reproductive health? DFID cannot answer. How much are we investing in family planning? DFID cannot answer. I've seen it in the minutes of their meeting. Why? Because there is just no mechanism to really track where the budget support money or the health systems money or whatever money ultimately ends up in which issue specific uh, or disease, you know, uh, it ends up. So this is an area I think that all of us can work together in terms of really looking at uh, where the monies uh, are in terms of family planning, reproductive health, sexual reproductive health and rights um, or population. But all other analysis, except probably yours, uh, I know you're doing your PhD on this, uh, has shown you know, that family planning by all uh, measures have really gone down significantly. And this is an area where most donors agree that this is an area where it should be spe spe specifically um, ramped up. My point, last point, is that if we cannot unite the family planning constituency with a reproductive health constituency, with a reproductive rights constituency, and those who believe that population dynamics and growth should be dealt with or should be looked into as a factor in development, then we will never succeed in terms of revitalizing this agenda. Because then only small sections of the community will be active. I think the first challenge, as uh, Professor Shipman would say in his article in Lancet, is unity first. And in my view, talking to some of our colleagues, some of you will probably disagree, one of the major reasons why the community is getting finally some traction in terms of increased funding for international family planning. And it's just not because we have a new administration in my view. It is because for the first time in a long, long time, the 40 or so international family planning organization NGOs united and said, let's ask for a billion dollars for family planning or as the former three uh, USA directors of population four said it should be one point two billion dollars. One of them is here. Uh, two one, two, two of them. So my, my view is that unless we're able to give democratic space for all of these different constituencies to work together, we can't. We would not be able to 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 have the same success that our brothers have so effectively done in the HIV/AIDS and or the uh, uh, malaria community. Well, thank you, all, all three of you, for a very rich discussion, one that is obviously very different today than it would have been even just a year ago. 
Um, I, I think uh, in, in many ways we're um, encouraged and energized by some of the trends, uh, but also we see that there's work to do in terms of starting with dialogue within our own community, just as the importance of uh, being in dialogue with some of the related uh, communities that we could talk with and should talk with uh, more and work with more. Um, I'll just kind of remind folks that you can share these insights uh, with others who are not here by sharing the video that will be on the website and our YouTube channel um, and finding, including the minister's, including the minister's video and some other related content. We, some of you were um, in the audience for Nick Kristoff and company's presentation of his book where he addressed maternal health and, and population programs just a few weeks ago. Um, that program as well as some follow-on interviews we did with, with Nick are, are on those same sites. So as I mentioned, we have a, a, an ability to continue this conversation with a reception that's just across the hall. Uh, but before we do that, won't you join me in thanking our panelists for a really rich discussion.